and indeed each of them represents a letter, be it from law, ethics, and sociology. We begin our le our le with our lecture from Professor Mike Parker, who, to be as brief as possible, uh, is a professor of bioethics at the University of Oxford and the director of the EPOC Centre, which is based within the Department of Public Health and Primary, uh, primary, primary Care, no, not anymore, I'm just Public Health now, at the University of Oxford. He has worked on some of the UK's biggest genomics projects in terms of both size and ambition, the experience of which form the basis of the talk today. So I will only say that um, these projects, World well, Interest Case Control Consortium, Malaria Gen, and 100,000 Genomes, each in their own way, have marked a staging post in biomedical collaboration and sharing, challenging and changing the way scientists work together, as well as bringing together huge biomedical data resources altering forever the research landscape and raising significant ethical issues. My other interest is in working with uh, clinical geneticists and counsellors through the Forum of the Genetics Club, which meets regularly in various locations in the UK and deals with questions arising in the clinic from working with families and individuals with genetic conditions. Mike published a book based on this work recently with Cambridge University Press called Ethical Problems of Genetics and Genetics Practice. As I said today, Mike will talk about the value of these very large genomics projects he's worked on in order to explore how they challenge models of consent and our understanding of autonomy. It's my great pleasure to hand over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Kate. Although, although it's called a lecture, my view really is that this is going to be a conversation, so that's the sort of spirit in which I'm going to be speaking. So the idea is to outline uh, um, a few issues that we can use to talk about, well, probably quite a lot of issues we can talk about, um, based on three scientific initiatives that I've been involved with in genomics, and then uh, Joe and Graham to say what they have to say and then to have an open discussion about it. So um, hopefully it won't be too formal and we can get any discussions on this. So as I say, to begin with, I just want to in introduce very briefly uh, three, three initiatives that I've been involved in, in one way or another. Uh, just as background, really, I won't say very much about them, but just as a, as a start off. So these are three, as, as Kate said, three initiatives in, in genomics. Um, two of them based in the, in the UK, one more international, but with the UK home. So the first was the World Trust Case Control Consortium, which uh, many of you will know about. And this was an early example of the Genome Wide Association study and, and established, played an important role in establishing that methodology as a way of doing research in this area. It brought together 14,000 cases of common diseases, and those are listed below bipolar disorder, coronary artery disease, Crohn's disease, and so on, diabetes, and 3,000 controls. And the controls are, came from the 1958 birth cohort study and from the blood service, UK blood service. The birth, 1958 birth cohort study is quite interesting because it was one of those studies, it was one of those studies where at the time of consent, it was, it was made clear to participants that there will be no commercial involvement in the use of the data. And that's had interesting uh, implications for what can and can't be done with that data since. So that's quite an interesting thing to talk about. The first uh, paper published by the Case Control Consortium was in 2007. And interestingly, just before that, they, so this was very much on the idea of open access and sharing data as quickly as possible. An independent data access uh, committee was set up a year before. And I was on that. Uh, Martin Bobber was the chair at the beginning, and I became the chair in 2012. Um, so I'm involved in that, in, in, in managing that data sharing um, process. One of the things that's been interesting about that actually has been the, was it the lack of interest, but a much lower level of interest in the data than I personally had been expecting. So that's kind of been something else we can talk about. As that, as that data access uh, approach has been developed over the years, other data sets have been added to that. So the UK uh, 10K project, some data from the Gambia, um, and a number of other sets of data have been released through that data access um, process. So that's one example of a, of, a, of a genomic study. And around about the same time as that, another study which was established called the Malaria Genomic Epidemiology Network, which I'm, I'm involved in as well. So on this one, I'm a PI, I was involved in writing the application to the Gates Foundation and to the um, Wellcome Trust. Um, and the, it's interesting that they arise at the same time. Behind the scenes, there's lots of conversation between the two projects about data access and data release and how that will be managed. Malarogen was established essentially as a data, data sharing project. That was the whole point, really, to generate data and share 
Uh, it's, an org it's an institution of a network of 31 partners in 21 countries. A large number of those countries or those institutions are in malaria endemic countries, as you can imagine. So Southeast Asia, Africa primarily, but also a number of other places around the world. Interestingly, this study has already collected 100,000 samples, cases and controls. So these are all sitting in the, the Sanger Institute in Cambridge and have been for quite a long time. And uh, they've got associated clinical data with them, uh, obviously mainly related to um, susceptibility to malaria and that sort of thing, but also ethnicity data and many other forms of data. And within that, within that group, uh, a number of research projects are being pursued. Many small projects, but three large projects. Some relating to some genomic genome-wide association studies, so hence the link with the case control consortium. Uh, looking at susceptibility to malaria, some studies of genomic determinants of immune response, and some studies looking at genomic diversity in, in malaria endemic populations. And those are essentially small scale sequencing projects uh, because of this concern that there might be some genetic uh, changes that were missed by larger international projects because they're very specific to particular places where malaria is, is an issue. And interestingly, this was one of the first examples of a managed approach to data at data release. So this was established. As a date, as a with a very strong commitment to open data sharing, um, open access, very quickly became apparent that, that that was going to be a problem, not just a problem in terms of worries about what was happening to the data, but also a worry in terms of scientific capacity. So many of the developing country partners who were essential to the success of the project were worried about generating lots of data and then being scooped by researchers in the US, Europe, and so on. And there, there was, in fact, one, one example of that actually happened. So there was, a, there was a process which was led by the ethics program, which I was the director of, to establish a data access agreement and actually data access policy which people could live with. And it was one of the first examples. There was quite a lot of pressure from Gates and others to be more open in the data sharing. But it was one of the very first examples of a managed approach to data access. Um, and look, as I said, there was a conversation with the World Trust Case Control Consortium. And in the end, they both had quite similar approaches to that. Um, but the malaria agenda was developed, as I say, through a process of consultation. And then the third example is uh, the 100,000 Genome Project, which is often portrayed as a wholly new initiative because it's 100,000 samples. So, but as, as I just said, the malaria agenda project did that quite a long time ago has been doing whole genome work, not sequencing on the same scale but, uh, in developing countries. It's quite interesting, I think, as a contrast. So the idea of the 100,000 Genome Project is 100,000 whole genome sequences from 70,000 NHS patients. There are fewer pe people than genomes because of the cancer to need to sequence tumors as well as, as well as people. The patients are going to come from three different groups to begin with at least, but obviously the idea is to roll this out into the NHS. So initially rare diseases, cancers and infections, primarily cancers and rare diseases, the infections, the work on infections is, hasn't really uh, got started yet to the same degree. And it's been run, being run by uh, public health <coughs> rather than genomic signal. And this genomic data is going to be collected and associated with clinical information from patients at the time of referral, but also they're giving consent to lifelong and, in fact, after their death, access to their medical records as part of that process. And the other, another interesting thing about this project is it's not straightforwardly a research project. And up from the beginning, it's clear that this work is being presented to participants as being project which is going to offer direct clinical benefits for some people, a project which is about developing understandings of disease, a project which is about uh, service development in the NHS, about developing genomic technologies to enable the NHS to become a genomic service in the future, and a project which is helping researchers and commercial companies to develop new medicines and so on. So it's, it's a hybrid project which is, has a number of aims and thus that raises some issues uh, about consent so one of the worries that people have had about this is that it's, con it's, it's consent to a hybrid activity. And historically, in research ethics, has been a strong view that, that research and clinical practice will be kept very separate. So this is a project which is not doing that. There's also going to be consent to a range of different kinds of findings as part of this project. So people are going to get what, what, what it called person findings. So that, what, in this case, that means findings related to the disorder that they were referred with, so the cancer, the rare disease. And clearly those are not straightforward, there's going to be a huge amount of complexity in that and uncertainty, but that at least is related to the reason they were referred to the first place. There's also going to be an optional uh, feedback around a small number of additional, what are called additional findings. So this is a short list, not like the American College of 
medical genetics, but there's a list of, depending on how many are agreed by the ethics committee, something like between five and ten conditions that the person can choose to have feedback on if they want them. And then there's going to be no additional feedback of any findings, any additional findings, incidental findings. So in some ways it manages the incidental findings question by saying they're not going to be incidental, they're going to be up front. That's sort of how it Data access is also going to be managed in an interesting way that's different to some other projects. So they'll be accessed by commercial companies and academic researchers through a managed process, so similar to the other projects I've already mentioned. Data, but data is not going to be released, so data will be in a secure place that people have to come into to carry out the research. Um, and it's the, met, the, the metaphor that's used is, the, is a reading library, so you can come in, do your research, you'll be observed while you're doing it, research activities will be monitored, um, and you can't take data away, you can only take away the results of your research. So that's, those are three different examples of, of genomic, post-genomic research, and essentially I've I'm just using those as a starting point and a framework perhaps for the subsequent discussion. I know that we'll get to hear about other initiatives as well, but that's... And there's been a lot of literature um, and media coverage of these kinds of events, and there's lots of, uh, lots of ethical and social implications have been um, highlighted in one way or another, a very long list, so... And, and I'm not going to read them all out, but, but there are, I think it's worth just sort of saying what some of them are. So one of, them, one of the issues that that's kind of uh, brings a lot of these together is the question of whether it's possible for people to give valid consent, and I'll say more about that later, in a situation where the, the future findings and uses of that, of that data or of, of their participation are unclear and uh, uncertain in a range of different ways. So is valid consent possible in that kind of situation? And related to that, a number of issues, there's been a lot of debate about how you should deal with findings which may be incidental um, or, or no or decided in advance. How do you manage how do you manage findings? And when you when have you ask the public and surveys of the public about what they worry about in this area, one of the things that comes top of the list is commercial access and worries about um, exploitation by private companies, uh, whether they be in the UK or elsewhere where around the world, of, of personal data is a worry. And that's related to another, a range of other issues to do with privacy, confidentiality, security, governance of data, issues related to other groups having access. So, for example, the police, uh, insurers, employers, and so on. So, a whole range of worries about that. Um, and less talked about, but to some extent, certainly in the, in the malaria gen study internationally, similar kinds of worries about samples, about blood samples and biological samples rather than data. So research ethics committees in Africa, which I've, I've spent a lot of time um, working in, in Africa uh, in this sort of area, are worried. They're much, they're much more worried about samples than they are about data. What's going to happen to the blood? And this isn't just about blood going outside to the West. In fact, I had a PhD student who uh, interviewed people in, in Western East Africa about their views on this, and they were, in fact, mostly more worried about them going to other African countries or to compatibilist institutions or cities than they were. In fact, they were, more, they were relatively relaxed about them going to the US, for example. Much more worried about them going, say, for example, to Nigeria or whatever the latest you know, neighboring country was. So it's quite interesting. And issues related to uh, recontact is another. So. And then a whole range of others which I won't go to related to duties of care, relationship between clinical practice, and so on. So there's a long list there. Oh, and, and the final one that basically like put called moral distance. And this is what I mean by this is ethics committees and participants and researchers worrying that whilst they know they have this relationship with the community or with the participants, people using the data somewhere else won't have the same kind of contextual understanding or social understanding. So they may not feel the same kinds of obligations and they may differently. And that's a big issue in relation to the blood samples, for example. So I'm not going to talk about all of those, obviously. So what I've decided to do is to focus on two related issues and to look <coughs> through two ethical questions. So the two issues are a broad one relating to the feedback of uncertain or unexpected findings and a related question about, relate, about unforeseen or uncertain for future uses of the data. And obviously an issue of that there is commercial companies. And to look at that through two questions, one related to the validity of consent, um, another a cluster of issues around social justice, fairness, and, so on, and, and the responsibilities of the institutions involved. And, broad, and basically what I'm going to say is, is this. So historically, consent 
has been seen as doing, fulfilling two functions. One has been more explicit than the other. So the, the, the explicit role of consent is to respect people's autonomy, their, their, uh, their right to decide what happens to them, to their sample, to their body and so on. That's the kind of explicit. But if you look at documents like Help the Helsinki document or the Nuremberg Code, they're also, it's also clear that they see the fact that you have to get consent from people as offering some kind of protection against harms, against uh, exploitation, against a range of other things. And, and they sort of get blended together, and, and I think that's been an issue in genomics as well, I'll come to that in a minute. But it's very important, I think, to recognize that they're actually different concerns. So the, the concern for respecting people's autonomy is not the same as the concern about protecting them from exploitation and, and harm. They're clearly related, but they're different. And I think in genomics they've become conflated in a problematic way, and actually they've ended up having the opposite effect to the one that was intended to some degree. So they've led, I think, to growth in paternalism and a reduction in, in the views that people that respect for people as moral agents is, is what this is all about. So I think this, that's been lost sight of to some extent. And I also think there's, there's been a neglect of important so, structural or social issues related to justice, inequality, so on, because of too much focus on consent. So that's the sort of broad uh, thesis, which is you know, obviously a provocative <coughs> one. So just to start off by talking about, about consent. So what's valid consent? Valid consent is generally seen in ethics and in law as having at least three components. It's consent that's informed and understood. It's consent that's voluntary and it's consent that's competent. And I'm not going to deal with competence here today. I'm just going to talk about voluntariness and information. So what, what kind of worries might we have about voluntariness in genomics? Well, it seems that some of them are going to be to do with, we don't, if we were observing a consent process, we would, would we want to be very clear that people weren't being coerced, and there's a whole range of ways in which that might happen, and we can talk for a long time about what's co coercion, what's undue inducement, and so on. But some sort of worry about, about coercion. We also, uh, it's also important that people aren't being deceived, they're not being told it's one thing when it's something else. And I also think it's important that, that people aren't being economical with the truth. So that if there is information that can be shared, and if there is uh, information that might be helpful to people's understanding, that's not being withheld from them in some way. Um, and reasonable efforts are being made to do that. And obviously there's going to be scope for discussion around, around all of those things. And so, for example, some of them might be related to issues related in medicine, more generally about patient-centeredness. There's a discussion about what's the relationship, what are the limits of reasonable persuasion, for example, about encouraging people to give up smoking or eating a healthy diet. And here, too, we might, there might be questions about, well, how far are we willing to encourage people to take part in something if we think it's in their interest? But I'm not going to engage with, in that discussion. But it seems to me there's a whole range of things that we could say, and more than I've said, about voluntariness and about what's really important about consent. And I think it's very important we pay attention to these. So when I'm saying, when I'm doubting, I'm raising questions about consent, I'm not saying consent isn't important, I'm saying actually it's very important, but I want to look at other aspects of it. So what about information and understanding? So what might our worries about that be? So in this kind of situation, I think the worry is a bit different. It's not the worry that people are lying or not being transparent or failing to be as open as they might be. That's, that's a kind of, that fits in that other group category. It's something else. The worry here is that people won't have a good or acceptable or a, a sufficient understanding of the implications of what it is that they're being asked to do. And if you look at the guidelines, they're, they're generally quite pragmatic about this. They say people, people should have a, a good understanding or a reasonable understanding. But actually, when you, when you listen to people talking about this, they often are much more, they, they seem to be suggesting that people have to have a full, complete, um, understanding of what they're about to do. And if they don't, that's worrying. Um, and ethics committees spend most of their time talking about that kind of thing. And that's clearly unachievable in well, most research, but it's certainly unachievable in genomic research. So my, when I'm in these meetings, for example, I'm on the board of Genomics England, so I sit in the scientific meetings. And in Malaria Gen, I was, I'm involved in a lot of scientific meetings there. And if you listen to them, it becomes apparent very quickly that large numbers of the scientists, in fact nearly all of the scientists, have only a partial understanding of the project. So malariologists don't understand uh, techniques of analysis, data analysis. They don't understand um, you know, some of the epidemi epidemiological aspects of this work, some of the genomics. And that's not a problem, that's why they're working together, because they all bring different skill sets to it. But it's 
it's clear, it becomes apparent very quickly that people don't understand the project as a whole. So if that's the case, why should we expect the participants to understand it? So, so that, and then what that suggests is not that we should be slack about our understandings, but we should be, um, we should be clear that what, about what we're trying to achieve. It's about what kind of level of understanding is ought to be required in this situation, given that we know that that's going to be impartial. And I think there's a worry here. So there's a, so there's, there's a worry that I just mentioned that it's impossible to have fully informed consent. But I also think there's a worry that it, it actually is, constitutes a failure to understand what autonomy is about. Um, and autonomy in the, in, does, in the real world does require some information and understanding. Clearly we need to understand something about what we're going to do to make an autonomous decision about it. But autonomy is also, the reason we respect autonomy, one of the aspects that we expect, respect and why we think it's morally important is because people in the real world have to make decisions based on their own values against the background of uncertainty and open-endedness. There are very few situations in life where we know what's going to happen. And so that the whole point of respect for people's moral agency is they ought to be able, they ought to, be able to make their own decisions in context of uncertainty, based on their own, based on the best information that they can get, but nonetheless recognizing that that's, that's partial to some degree. And as long as this doesn't arise out of deception, coercion, um, lack of transparency, then we ought to respect their moral agency. And obviously I'm talking about competent people here and not dealing with that, that issue. So what I think that means is that broad consent, even very open-ended consent, so for example, consent for incidental findings, even where they're not very clearly specified in advance, if, they, if that's not possible, is perfectly compatible with, with autonomy. As long as people aren't being deceived, coerced, or having information with help from them. So for, for example, if we're coming at it purely from the perspective of autonomy, people ought to be able to consent to incidental pertinent and additional findings. They ought to be able to consent to placing their personal data in a research context without really necessarily knowing very much about how that's going to be used. They ought to, in fact, be allowed to consent to put their information in places where it's well known there's a, there's a security problem, as long as that's appropriately managed, etc. and they know that's the case. And they ought to be able to consent to complicated hybrid activities. So the argument here is that primarily when we're thinking about consent, we should be making sure that people participating is voluntary, not based on all those things that I worry about, that I mentioned. And I think to assume something otherwise is paternalistic and in an unacceptable way. And that might sound, it could sound like I'm becoming a libertarian, but I'm not. I think the problem here is that it's placing the emphasis in the wrong place. So the problem with an overemphasis on informed consent is that it locates the ethical problems of genomics, some of those ones on that list to do with exploitation, social justice, and security in the wrong place. And that means they don't get taken as seriously as they should be. So there's a couple of uh, digressions I can't remember. Did I? Is that OK if I said that? No, that's So just a couple of digressions just to illustrate this. So one attempt at the moment, for example, to address worries about broad consent and this idea that people aren't getting enough information to make um, a, a morally uh, acceptable choice is the, is the model of dy called dynamic consent. So the strongest version of this is the idea that, that you develop some kind of technological me uh, mechanism, an iPad uh, portal or something, web portal, to enable participants to make case-by-case -case decisions about the use of their data. And I think there are a number of problems with this. Firstly, it doesn't solve the problem because just because you get things in series rather than all at once doesn't mean that you're going to understand them. So a project comes your way, you're still going to have a partial understanding of it, and you're still going to have to try to make sense of whether it's the right thing for you or not. It may be easier to do them one at a time, but it doesn't, it doesn't in itself deal with the information or understanding issue. The second worry I have is an empirical one which I haven't got time to go into here, but it seems to me that despite my disagreements on, with her on politics and worse, and already on this right in relation to trust. So building this kind of constant monitoring and access doesn't support trust, in fact, has the potential to undermine it. And similarly with Marion Strathern's work on audit culture, that it may actually have the opposite effect to the one that it's intended to have. And finally, it's paternalistic. It fails to recognize people as moral agents who are able to make decisions at the beginning of a project on the basis of uncertainty. Now, I'm not against the idea of dynamic consent. If people want to offer, scientists want to offer it, then they should be able to offer it, and people should be able to have it if they want it. But as a requirement, I think it's, 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 um, 
basically uh, misguided. Another illustrative digression, which I won't, I won't spend any time on. There's been a lot of worry recently about hybridity in these areas. So the idea that consent isn't acceptable in the context of initiatives which are, are, have these multiple elements, clinical, clinical elements, healthcare elements, and research elements. And the, same, and the worry here is that the therapeutic misconception apart from anything else. So the idea that people might misunderstand that relationship and get it wrong. And clearly that's important. We should make best efforts to try to help people to, to understand that. But to say that they shouldn't be able to consent to that kind of complexity um, and on the basis of good evidence and good information is, I think, paternalistic. And it's, and it's um, patronizing to some extent. OK, so having said that consent is important, but it's not, the, it's not going to address those broader issues, that suggests that we need to be thinking about ethics beyond consent. And as I said, I think we've overemphasized informed consent, and that's been a mistake. So I think there are a couple of reasons, a couple of additional reasons why that's worrying. One is it turns consent into a kind of contractual arrangement. And I think that's a criticism that can be made particularly about the approach of American funders, for example, in research in Africa. That it's sort of as long as people sign up to it and understand it, it's, it's acceptable. And I think that's I think that's not the way to think about these things. But also I think one of the reasons why it's not the way to think about things is it because it's inherently incapable of addressing justice and equity issues. So that again is, 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 this is what I mean about the ethics being in the wrong place or focusing too much on informed consent. So, so, I'm, so the primary justice question here shouldn't be seen as about fully informed consent, but it should be seen as about what protections and controls need to be put in place so that when people do use their moral agency, they're not exploited, discriminated against, or unfairly treated, for example, at work. So we need to focus on that, and if we focus on that, then we may be able to do something more about it. Consent's not going to do that work for us. So we think about some of the social justice issues in genomics. Um, some of the ones I mentioned earlier. So it worries about discrimination. That people might be discriminated against on the basis of their genome. Uh, in Africa, uh, for example, in the H3 Africa project, there's a worry about ethnicity data. So ethnicity data is very important because it helps deal with population structure in some of these, stu some of these studies. So it's important to capture that data. The trouble is you now got all this ethnicity data in your database associated with these samples and other data and that there's a, there's a worry that that might have some implications that, that, uh, that mean that people are discriminated against. Issues related to privacy, con confidentiality and so on, and particularly in the context of data linkage where you're bringing data, data sets together. Issues related to security standards and protections, Ensuring that data, use of data in the future are compatible with the reasonable expectations of people at the time of consent, even if they don't know exactly what use, those uses are going to be. The addressing of health inequalities. So many of the meetings that I've been in, for example, around the 100,000 Genome Project, the issue of what are we going to do about making sure that people from black and minority ethnic groups have access to, to genetics is, has come up on a regular basis. And similarly, issues about priority setting in research. Why is this disease being studied rather than some other disease? How are we going to make sure that? So these are these are social justice issues, and I don't think they can be dealt with by consent. And I think they need to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. And I think it's a real problem that the focus on this contractual approach to consent and the, what I think is the overemphasis on fully informed consent has meant that we've lost sight of the importance of these issues. So the key, and, and that's also, it's important because it's, it's right that we think about these things, but it's also important because the sustainability of this science and the social license, license to practice, as sociologists uh, tend to catch it, depend on getting these things sorted. Now, it seems to me likely that protection is going to be needed in a number of places, and I don't want to suggest necessarily that these have to be done through legislation and maybe other ways of doing it. But, for example, it seems to me we need to think seriously about genetic non-discrimination legislation. We need to make, think carefully about ways of making sure that unconsented attempts to identify individuals are either very closely monitored, for example, in the genomics England approach, there, there, that can be seen, but where you're sharing data, for that to be illegal, or at least there to be some sanction against that. Ensuring that genetic services are available to all groups free at the point of delivery, uh, whatever, they, whatever their background. And we need better, better professional and other guidance about what counts as good genomic practice. 
I don't think consent, dynamic or otherwise, can solve those problems. And in fact, I think it's a distraction from them, as I said. So a couple of, a couple of uh, conclusions, which are, are apparent from what I've said, but I'll just sort of sum them up. So the achievement of, if you think of the achievement of high ethical standards in genomic research, and clearly I've only focused on these two areas, there's much more that can said. I think we need to recognize two important related but different concerns. So firstly, some concerns about consent. We need to make sure that we do our best to gather evidence about what, what's the good way to get consent and the way, and we need to think about helping people to understand. So that's, there's clearly a need for good information sharing and, and for attempts to help people to understand. Uh, and work needs to be done on that. But there needs to be recognition, a much stronger recognition, I think, than we currently have about the moral agency of patients and members of the public to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. That's what being a moral agent means. And we need to think very carefully and I think focus more than, much more than we do on avoiding deception, coercion, and that list of things that I mentioned earlier. And there I think I'm very strongly with Anora Neal and Neil Manson when they talk about informed consent in their book. But this is, this, is what, this is what we should be focusing on. The way I differ is because I think this is, it's very important that we complement that with an attention to, to justice. So the establishment through legislation requirements by funders or professional guidance of measures to ensure that research participants are not exploited, discriminated because they participate in research with an open-ended dimension. To it. It, and I think this means we need to engage with these social justice issues head on now. And I don't think, as I said, they can be dealt with through consent. And I also think it's worth noting, given I put Monerogen on there, that there's a very important international dimension to this. So we can't avoid global health inequities of the issues, capacity building. So for example, striking to me, uh, as an anecdote, I went to the first meeting of the Atria African Consortium, which is funded by the NIH, the American NIH, and the Wellcome Trust, to build genomics in Africa. So this is um, human heredity and health, geno Afri genomic, Af African genomics by Africans for Africa. That's the sort of thing. Uh, it strikes me at that meeting how many UK and US based geneticists with no interest in African genetics were present. And that's because it's, there are really opportunities to develop tools for genomics in European populations based on that knowledge. So that, that suggests to me equity and reciprocity issues, which are very important. Um, so, just to conclude then. So, it seems to me that these are not, this is actually quite interesting and it actually offers a way of thinking about research ethics which has been, I think, neglected historically. So, biobanks and genomics look like a problem for research ethics, but actually they're also an opportunity. <coughs> I think they help us to see the way in which moral, moral agency should be understood. They, need, they help us to see the need to pay attention to these, these consent issues which are not about information. And they, they make, us, make it clear to us that we need to focus on the social justice, institutional, even state responsibilities in the context of research ethics if it's going to be successful. And there's obviously a polit political element to this, and my political position on this is that the NHS is an important part of this, and healthcare provided free at the point of delivery is, is actually really closely very important in, in the world of genomics. And my final slide then is just that it's actually quite interesting to some extent, although it's got lots of other problems, that to some extent the 100,000 Genome Project does at least gesture to some of these. So it does accept the possibility that consent to complex and uh, as yet undetermined at future outputs is acceptable. But because, and at least in part because it combines it with some other protections, it combines high level protections on data access strong contractual uh, arrangements and the connections to the NHS, which I think is actually quite, quite important. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Jill will talk about her work with Generation Scotland, um, which she published a number of sole and co-authored papers, which I won't miss. Thank you. 
So I came along in about 2004. It's important to say that Sarah was already on the case on this one and was already conducting upstream engagement before Generation Scotland had even began to, come to, uh, even began to collect samples. So there had already been expert reviews, there had already been public events. Um, so with my um, uh, coming along, we started to begin to think about deliberation and about representation. As I'm going to show you, there, and as Mike has already touched upon, there are very common ethical and social issues associated with DNA databases. These aren't necessarily new issues, but I think the way that they interlink um, is unusual. I want to focus on um, uh, sharing with you some of the results from our ongoing deliberative forums with publicly spirited citizens groups, citizens groups, and then also take some of the concerns that they have and show you and ask you how representative they were for um, members of the public in Scotland. I mentioned briefly there the fact that um, some of these ethical and social issues associated with DNA databases aren't particularly new. There is issues around informed consent for actually. But for me, there's an intriguing LC mashup, if you like. And it begins for me again on the issue around unanticipated unethical use. So this, I think, is a springboard to where everything else, if again with Jenga, um, collapses upon. Because with unanticipated, un un potentially, I'm not saying unethical, could be unethical use. You have the notion of the need to bring in the, um, the point of broad consent. Okay, with broad consent, you then have to allow for people to withdraw. Allowing people to withdraw, therefore, can also compromise the idea of keeping your personal information forever under um, tight, secure conditions. And not only that, you're saying this, but on the other hand, you're also saying to people, well, this is research, this isn't a genetic test, so we're not going to give you any um, genetic feedback. Circle that within the idea that pharmaceutical access will be necessary in order for the organisation to be successful, we will also be required to pay for the results in order to make the business of the DNA database work, but there's also some ideas around beneficiary. We took some of these issues to um, publicly um, spirited citizens and we stayed with them for quite a long time and we kept on going back to them because we really wanted them to deliberate these difficult ethical and social issues. So the model that I'm presenting here, which is not atypical I don't think for Generation Scotland, but is around the issues around broad consent, about withdrawal, when do people withdraw, how long do their samples and their information, how long do they keep them for. How do you conduct this idea of reversible anonymization? And how do people feel actually about not having any feedback on their genetic propensity to um, inherit a disease? And of course, pharmaceutical company access was planned and is planned. So as I said, we, um, we went up in 2006 to the north of Scotland um, with several deliberative events with varying degrees of success, which you can talk about later. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, these people were there to talk about something. So they were more likely to find problems. Results, broadly speaking, from these guys. There was a feeling that reconsent, actually, reconsent was a means to avoid possible abuse. But at the same time, it was also unnecessary, it was additional baggage, it was confusing. So there was a very strong ambivalence about consent. There's questions around keeping the sample indefinitely and why would you need that and could you not destroy all identifying information? The dominant view um, at the time was that um, if you withdraw, absolutely everything should be destroyed. Now, of course, that's quite difficult because the sample and the information we already have gone somewhere else. And although genetic feedback was not generally expected, it was just kind of like, well, what if it was useful? The dominant view, again, my touched on this, is that pharmaceutical company access. This was this was very negative, but it came over very passionately. That um, why would you want to commercialise something that I've given through the off? Um, at the same time, there's a kind of thing that if I give, and if you give something, so if you share the benefits, should we be coming? That would be acceptable. It's interesting. We kind of knew about these issues anyway because lots of previous research had been done on um, ethical and social aspects of DNA databases. So we kind of knew what was, what was bugging me was like, who else feels like this? 
and why would they feel like this? So in a sense, we knew that there was a sort of ideological representation, that these were issues, but we didn't have any idea about statistical representation of them. So um, I won't go into the details again. You can see some of the um, work that we did. We worked very closely with Ipsos Mori and Generation Scotland, actually, to formulate um, some questions to put out to members of the Scottish public that we felt would be valid and robust and strongly representative. Obviously, we wanted to establish representative nature about these kind of um, issues, but we're also kind of interested in thinking, well, what is important? Is consent important? Is that the most important thing in people's minds? And if it is, would it relate to any ideas or any feelings that they have about potential participation? So again, we have the same topics. We have issues around consent and our time limit for the use of the data in the sample and our feedback on any genetic analysis. What happens to the data when someone withdraws pharmaceutical company access to sampling and benefit sharing? So in order to do that, because we're quite ambitious, we um, constructed a discrete choice experiment, which is not uncontroversial. It's basically like asking somebody if they like apples and oranges. Okay? It's a kind of non-comparative way of saying, what do you prefer? And you might not prefer either, but we will force you to choose. These were the levels of the attributes. Um, and on the left hand side, the, my left, the right, on this side. And these are the levels. We did a lot of thought and a lot of work went into thinking about the governance and about whether these were actually doable or not. So we sampled 1,000 people and we gave them 384 pairs. No, we didn't. We didn't give 384 pair scenarios of each attribute and level through the statistics. Um, with the magic of statistics, we were able to figure out which attribute and which level could be given to each person. And then we can then sort of begin to put together a picture around um, what the ideal model would look like. And we also had um, checks within the survey itself to check the results of the discrete choice experiment against the Likert scale. Um, I'll just let you have a look at that and explain it while you're looking at it. Basically, you can see the um, attributes along the bottom. The distance between the different levels represents, if you like, how important it is to that particular participant. So if you can see there, you can see that benefits, benefit sharing to NHS for charity is the most important attribute that's up here. And I grant, yes, it's, easy, it's an easy thing to say, isn't it, we should be benefit sharing, but I won't go into that just now. The next most important attribute in the blood power of importance was um, what happened to the sample and the data after death. And this kind of like was for me very interesting because what the participants were telling us was after death, um, just keep everything. They've given you it, just keep it. Like, don't fuck around with it. And this relates to um, um, withdrawal, as you can see next to it, which is if you withdraw, you take everything. So there's this very all or nothing approach to it. Okay. Feedback um, came forth, where you can see that there was some feeling that actually if it's useful, we should have time to feed back. Um, pharmaceutical company access came fifth down the list of attributes. It's quite low, but again, it's saying no. And consent was last. So what do we say? I'm sorry about the business and the study. It's kind of something that I was trying to think while I was preparing this. So I was trying to think about well, how does this then compare to the model of Generation Scotland, its governance model, as it was developing at that time? Because remember, governance is, is in progress, okay? It's not something that's static. And basically, then for sharing at that time, well, it might have been organizational policy, and there were certainly strong indications from both the survey and the related <coughs> work that this was a positive, so this was top. Time limit, time limit for the sample of the data. Again, positive indications and an agreement with Generation Scotland policy that, um, that, that you know, there's no there's no withdrawal. Genetic feedback is a tricky one, isn't it, really? There was some indication that if it was possible, if it was um, possible and if it was useful, that maybe it should be given. Withdrawal, again, all or nothing, all or nothing. Take it, keep it, take it away, take it all away. Um, so company access was not allowed, again, this is a very strong justice issue, I think, that makes them sort of touch upon. The consent, 
and changed the way that they said that they would participate. There was very little difference um, in, in any change there. And it's quite interesting, actually, because I was just reading the paper um, on the cohorts of the young generation in Scotland, which suggested about 12% of people actually did take part. So here we have, I can't see the last one, 18, is that 18? 18% very likely in seven. So that's 25% is quite a significantly big difference between. Was it the actual 12% or not? Was it the actual 12%? It was complicated because it was the, the first. Oh, the first trend. And then yes. the yes. Yes. Family, so it was a bit complicated. Okay. One of the um, things around, of course, which is like of um, interest to us is about why did they decide to take part? You know, what was the decision around it? And what we find um, that there are, of course, demographic kind of sort of variation, the willingness to, to, to participate. But the fact that came over really powerful was the importance of the everyday. I would take part because yeah, I want to help somebody and I'm interested or I know someone who has a particular disease, a generation of Scotland's is going to focus on, or um, actually I'm going to I will see them okay. From not taking part, from unwillingness, Reasons we're given like, well, I don't really like needles, I don't have any time, I'm not really interested, and it didn't really have anything to do about governance. So, do we throw the baby out with bathwater? If governance has got nothing to do with participation, why bother, really? Um, well, obviously, governance is not only about participation. I want to go back on my last two slides and just reflect on this idea of engagement. And I was just having a little bit of fun with myself, so I like, forgive me for um, this. Because the whole, the whole idea of engagement, what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be engaged? Well, you know, the public engagement, the consultation, and the sort of idea of governance in Generation Scotland, you know, we had a lot in common. And Generation Scotland were definitely willing to listen and respond and act in relation to some of the consultation findings. It wasn't a long term engagement. You know, we couldn't be together forever. And we didn't get married in the end because there wasn't enough money actually to do it. So we couldn't afford to be together. But I don't feel we used each other. It wasn't a kind of sort of like window dressing for the consultation. And I don't and I think the social scientists got a lot out of it, but I don't feel that we used each other. But it is unclear how we might have ended up together and whether that model would have affected the long term participation and retention. So this is just a few disconnected um, final thoughts about whether we can work out. If I'm saying, which I am suggesting, that participation is located in the everyday, then it becomes more important, um, becomes more important in this risk society to think about ideas of trust. And for these people, because their decisions may have been located in the everyday, in a sense they were obliged to trust. They had to trust because they didn't have any other reason not to. But consent, as Mike Sporey suggested, is not the panacea to all ethical, local, and social issues. There are other issues around justice, around discrimination, and around exploitation. But dealing with these issues is also constrained within the parameters of the organisation. There's only so much an organisation can do without potentially compromising the whole success of the project. And I think for me, consultation or engagement is ideologically admirable. But it's really difficult to do. And even though it can reveal public concerns, it's not really a panacea for addressing them either. And it can't do that, and it shouldn't do it either, because then that links back to the idea of why you're doing it. And consultation is not, not, is not about being instrumental. It's not about looking at ways in which you can increase participation. So if that's what I'm saying about consultation, I wonder then what role is there for governance to do. Real. Thanks a lot, Jill. Okay, so our final speaker respondent is Professor Bryn Murray, who is a professor of medical jurisprudence here at Edinburgh Law School, as most of you know. He's currently giving a Welcome to Senior Investigator Award entitled Confronting Liminal Spaces of Health Research Regulation, which is a five-year interdisciplinary project. He was a founding director of the Mason Institute and he has many policy roles, so I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, he's currently on the, a member of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and he was also chair of the Privacy Advisory Committee in Scotland from 2005 to 2013. Today he's going to talk about reflexive governance in relation to his work on the UK Biobanks Ethics and Governance Committee and the second chair.
um, from 2000 to 2000, uh, 2006 to 2010, um, which was not quite the beginning, but it was certainly early days, and we were um, negotiating some, yeah, for the first time, some new and, and, and very challenging uh, um, issues related to this game changing. Concern about the federalisation of consent. Um, and Kate said earlier on that it's interesting that the three of us uh, offer a, an ethical, social, and, and legal perspective. Interestingly, from, from my perspective as the lawyer on, on the, the team, I'm going to say virtually nothing about the law except to um, make the point that it, uh, the law is actually going down that worrying route of fetishizing consent. Uh, the example that we have at the moment um, is in the context of privacy protection. We have in Europe uh, a draft regulation for um, data protection and what's being proposed at the moment is that we have a provision in there which not only seeks uh, valid and informed consent but the consent should now be specific and it goes against everything that Mike was arguing for before. As I say, that is a, is a draft at the moment, hopefully that will not stand but it's a, a good example of how the law usually brings up the, up the rear in these issues and actually law is, is very rarely the complete answer. So I'm not going to say much more about law. What I'm going to focus on, as Kate said, was my experiences um, in UK Biobank. Jill briefly mentioned UK Biobank, just to remind you all. Um, UK Biobank is an initiative that has recruited half a million, half a million plus um, adults uh, who were 40 to 69 at the time of recruitment around the UK, um, with the exception of Northern Ireland, um, to build a research resource. Uh, people have been asked to donate uh, blood samples and other samples uh, to create a DNA resource and also to um, allow ongoing access to health related information so that the resource can be opened up publicly and internationally to promote health related research. And it's a determinedly very, very broad approach to the type of research that is um, possible. Because of that broad approach, it means that it's not possible for UK Biobank to tell participants in advance what's going to happen, exactly the challenges that, that Mike outlined. And therefore, one of the challenges that the funders faced when setting up UK Biobank was how do you actually go about governing this? And as I'm going to explain in due course, two key elements of the governance framework for UK Biobank are first of all, there is something called an ethics and governance framework, which in essence, lays out the promises of UK Biobank to its participants in the wider society of what it will and will not do. And secondly, um, an entity was, was set up called the Ethics and Governance Council to monitor compliance of UK Biobank with that Ethics and Governance Framework. But what I want to explore with you is well, what type of, of approach is that? Is it regulation? Is it governance? If it is governance, what type of governance is it? And we can address some of these, these questions that we've raised previously, including the last one that Jill mentioned, what will this look for The brief shorthand, if you like, of that, that approach that UK Biobank has to uh, its governance is what has been called the critical friend model. So if you think about that as a horizontal relationship with UK Biobank here, that's conducting the research, engaging with its participants, the Ethics and Governance Council exists in a horizontal relationship to monitor and advise on what's actually going on. It's not a regulation relationship, which can often be much more in the form of top-down command and control, it's actually more critical friends there to, to engage UK Biobank on issues as and when they arise. And give some examples of those as we go through the talk. The brief, the brief um, outline of my talk are first of all to explain in a little bit more detail what was the rationale for establishing the Ethics and Governance Council, what's its remit and its relationship to UK Biobank. Um, I want to give you some examples of how I think the council has been and can be responsive when consent can do all of that work. And finally, I'd like to offer you some academic reflections on what kind of governance model I think the Ethics and Governance Council actually is. So it's important to remember that an, um, an initiative like UK Biobank has been set up within the pre-existing legal framework. No law had to be passed in order to allow UK Biobank to take place. So therefore that means it has to comply with existing data protection legislation, 
uh, the Human Tissue Act, it's equivalent of Scotland, uh, the Common Law Confidentiality, and indeed a plethora of other legal uh, provisions that apply to initiatives such as this. Some people had argued that we need yet, far, yet further laws, but the question, the question was whether that was important or whether actually something different was, was actually required. And the way in which the funders approached the questions around how UK buyback should be governed was to set up an interim advisory group which existed from 2002 to 2004 of about uh, nine members. I was on it, Honor O'Neill was on it. <clears throat> and we really started with a, a blank page. We say, well, this is, the, this is the initiative, this is what we're proposing to do. At that time, and it's, it's really important I stress this, at that time, the idea, the very idea of broad consent, as Mike laid out earlier on, was incredibly controversial. There was a real push that this, had, this could only be legitimate in ethical terms if we went down an informed consent route. And of course, if we went down an informed consent route, a project UK by bank is simply not viable. So there was a lot of discussion about what, what did that actually mean. And it's amazing how much, I think, ethical and other thinking has shifted in the 10 plus years since that uh, interim advisory group um, was established and made recommendations to the funders who are primarily the Wellcome Trust and Medical Research Council. The reason why it was thought ultimately that an ethics and governance council was necessary was because of the breadth of the consent, this anxiety about the nature of our consent and the uncertainty that it represents. Also the long term nature of the, the, the project, it, it takes uh, information from people and it will also access it once people have died, so similar to some of the projects that Mike mentioned earlier on. And also at that time, because despite the existing regulatory mechanisms, the role of existing ethics committees, research ethics committees, was very much in an upfront fashion to approve research. There wasn't an ongoing relationship between the ethics committees and the project. So therefore, once you cleared that first part of getting approval, there was no other sort of mechanism to actually ensure that what the, the, the science said it would do, they actually did, or to protect the, the, the interests as one might arise. So there, ultimately, therefore, the rationale for the, the Ethics and Governance Council was to act as an additional safeguard and a foundation of trust, not just for participants, but also for the wider society, and to act as a trusted third party in this role as a critical friend. And the mantra of the council has always been to speak about UK buyback and not for UK buyback. And um, as Kate said earlier, I was the chair from 2006 to 2010, the second chair, and um, that was a really interesting period because it, I took up the position just before UK buyback started recruiting, and I stepped in just after the finished recruiting. So it was a, a period when there was a lot of activity. And we also, um, as, as council members, um, had some uh, road shows around the country talking about our role. But interestingly, one of the key misunderstandings that persisted in all that time was the idea that somehow we were speaking for UK Biomark. People said, what are you doing about this? And we kept having to say, it's not what we're doing. The council's there to monitor what UK Biomark is doing. But that, that message did not penetrate into a, a constant struggle. Um, there were some public consultations. If you look at the literature, some of these were uh, <clears throat> subject to quite a lot of criticism because it was felt that, yes, there was a, a consultation exercise, but it went into a black hole, and then all of a sudden the ethics and governance framework and the council emerged. It wasn't quite clear if it was sufficiently robust in the way that sociologists like Jill would, would expect. But interestingly, the results of those public consultations did have support for governance. So counter to what Jim was suggesting in the context of Generation Scotland, there was quite a strong appetite for some form of oversight body that it be established and that act independently of a UK biobank itself. Generally it was about ensuring appropriate standards of behaviour and ethics and also to make sure <coughs> that um, UK biobank acted within the original terms of the consent that people had provided. It's also there to make sure there's no funny business, this is direct, direct quotes, um, and um, it's, it's felt that the, the, the monitoring body, the oversight body, as it was referred to at that, that time, should be professional people who know what's going on, and uh, that, that's a slightly arrogant way of putting it, but uh, the way that the council's been set up, and I think it remains the case, is it's, it's usually about 11 to 13 people who uh, come from different disciplines. An interesting question, however, and this is maybe something for discussion uh, later on, is whether or not the Ethics and Governance Council should in any way attempt to be representative of the participants. Uh, when I was <coughs> chair, we had that conversation about a couple or three times, and, all, and each time we always came to the same conclusion, which was no, for a variety of reasons. First of all, how can you be representative of a heterogeneous uh, group of half a million people? 
Secondly, there, were, there, are, there are members on the council who are uh, participants in UK Biobank, so we can speak from that, that, that perspective. But thirdly, and importantly, it kind of undermines the, the notion that UK Biobank, the resource, is a public resource for access to promote health-related research. It is not the preserve of those people who have very generously participated in the project, so why should they necessarily be privileged in having a say in how, how it's actually covered? But that's, that's controversial and I'd be interested in, in hearing some views. And finally, the we thought that an oversight body should comply with uh, the normal principles of um, you know, appropriate conduct in public life. So, all of that to say that the Ethics and Governance Council did have some, some support from the, the uh, consultation exercises and it was, it was set up. It's rule effectively, another way of putting it, if you think that <coughs> the Ethics and Governance Council is there to hold up a mirror to UK Biobank. It's not there to control what UK Biobank does, it can't do that. Um, it's about um, <coughs> um, entering ethically robust dialogue with UK Biobank and ideally with other publics, etc. Although, interestingly, since I've stepped down, uh, it's been decided by the funders that the council should not have any more public meetings. That's a role for UK Biobank itself and not for the council. Again, I'd be interested in hearing your views there. It seems to me that that actually potentially hinders the role of an entity like the council to, to, to uh, monitor appropriately. But one of the issues that, that, that comes up a lot is well, does this entity, the Ethics and Governance Council, actually have teeth? What happens if UK Biobank does not respect the terms of the Ethics and Governance Framework? It goes against the fundamental board concept that was actually being, being provided. And the answer is it doesn't have teeth in the form of sanction, but it can escalate issues. It can escalate issues to uh, funders, it can, it can take issues to the board of directors of UK Biobank, and ultimately it could, it could go public if it really had concerns doing. As I said in many occasions before, the problem with that last option is that's the nuclear option. Once the Ethics and Governance Council presses that nuclear button, it effectively will destroy any relationship with UK Biobank. When people started um, leaving UK Biobank, it would also be potentially destroy, destroy the project. So it's there as a possibility, but whether it's a, a realistic possibility is, is, is debatable. Nonetheless, that, that's as much as the council can do. It's very much as a critical friend role. And therefore, just to emphasise this, it's important to be clear about the things that the Ethics and Governance Council is not there to do. It's not there to assume uh, responsibility for the ethical management of the resource. Um, in the early days when I, when I was the, uh, the chair, we had conversations with UK Biobank about that, and it was, it was a bit of a negotiation that went on, so that we were clear about it. Ultimately, I think they employed Mike to give them some separate ethical input, because they have to take ownership of the project. UK Biobank has the, is responsible for the framework, Council is there independently to monitor and oversee that. It's not, the council wasn't there for, like, to give the ethical input, it's about we can buy back taking responsibility for its policies and the council um, overseeing all that, that entire process. To emphasize once again, it's to speak, um, on, uh, it's not going to speak on behalf of UK Biobank, um, and it's for the, the, the UK Biobank to own and develop the ethics and governance framework and also any associated policies, such as incidental findings, that's something that's, that's best the council more, more recently. Let me give you some examples of the ways in which I think this type of governance arrangement actually adds value. And one of the reasons why, again, emphasising my point about the limits of consent, even if you've got broad consent. Um, so in the Ethics and Governance Framework, there, the first version, the initial version, talks about um, ways in which you could withdraw from UK Biobank. And there, there, there are three ways. For our purposes, this one here is what's important that you can actually withdraw and say I don't want any further, further use um, of my data or my samples. And in those circumstances, in the initial version of the Ethics and Governance Framework, there was the following guarantee that's underlined it. UK Biobank will destroy all of your health-related data, except, of course, it's been passed on and it has gone somewhere else, as Joe mentioned earlier on. Fine, that seems fairly um, straightforward. It then turned out, actually, let me see again. It then turned out, <coughs> that when UK Biobank was developing its IT and security provisions, and this is where I reached the limits of my understanding, but um, technically, if, even if you remove somebody from the system, you still need to have markers to know that somebody was in the system to verify that they'd been removed from the system. In other words, you couldn't actually remove all the information, and therefore this guarantee that UK Biobank will destroy all of your health risk information was technically not right. So UK Biobank brought that, that issue to the council and we had a very robust dialogue and gone for quite a few meetings about what should actually be done. 
One option, of course, would be, do you reconsent? Do you go back to all the people who had already been uh, brought into the project, who had given the broad consent, and ask them to consent again? Well, beyond the logistics of that, there's also the economic transaction costs, and also the question of whether or not that's actually a defensible, ethical approach to deal with, with, with this issue. So we discussed it, and this was our uh, <clears throat> um, ultimate agreed recommendation. First of all, the ethics and governance framework changed, and it's determined they always be the living instruments. It's, it's, it's supposed to change. So the wording has changed now to say that um, if, you, if you choose the no further use option, it means you, you will no longer be contacted and will not obtain any further information from you. And any samples collected will no longer be available to researchers uh, and you only hold your information for archival audit purposes. So that's a more accurate reflection of the IT developments. So the EGF was, was, was uh, <coughs> uh, amended. The information leaflet was changed for, for new participants and ultimately, the new pages were put on UK Biobike and the Ethics and Governance Council website. It was not felt necessary to go back to people who had already consented. It was thought that this was a sufficiently robust approach in order to deal, to deal with, with, with the issue. And that, that was the, the way in which uh, it, it panned out. Second unforeseen challenges could UK Biobike be a resource for cloning? Back to its original purpose, it's there to create a research resource. There's uh, human material, there's access to data, and it, its purposes are determinedly broad. It's health related research. So, during my chairmanship, we received, um, in a fairly short uh, period of time, um, two what seemed like independent letters asking people whether or not, asking us whether or not UK Biobank could, could ever be a, a, an access request to. Um, to, to explore, I'm using cloning as a deliberately emotive term, related to stem cell work. The, the short answer was, well, possibly yes, because the, um, the nature of the, the, the resource is deliberately broad. Um, <clears throat> what then happened was that actually these, the people who said, said in those letters actually knew each other, and then they wrote an opinion piece in Lancet saying that, oh, UK Biobank could actually be used for, for, for these purposes. <laughs> Somewhat sort of um, um, <coughs> constructed and contrived the, the, the request. We, in turn, wanted to write an opinion piece just being clear about what was and was not the situation, and we weren't allowed to do that because of the limits of the Lancet, but we were allowed to, to uh, submit a 250 word uh, letter, which was actually quite good in terms of writing to make sure you really clear about your core messages. And the core messages that we tried to convey in that letter were the following. First of all, um, it's important that um, to understand that, that broad use and the idea that setting simply because the purposes of UK Biobank are broad does not necessarily mean that something necessarily would happen down the line. Because we have to remember that UK Biobank sits within this pre existing and very intensive regulatory framework. So, for example, another entity such as the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority would have to be involved in taking decisions of whether or not that resource could be used. It wouldn't just be a decision for UK Biobank. Secondly, we confirmed the future-facing role for participants, understanding that um, the, the role of what people have signed up to and the way in which the project will, will, will develop necessarily is, is, is uncertain, and it's not possible to say now what might be ethically acceptable in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate for a currently constituted Ethics and Governance Council to try and tie the hands of a future one in several decades. Time. So we confirm the future facing role of participants is about this longitudinal uh, approach. Secondly, we reiterated the nature of broad consent, which I think emphasises Mike's point about agency. If the sign up to something was for health, health related research, there may well be ethical concerns today about that, but if a, an application did come in, it would have to be considered in light of what was the ethical and, and regulatory climate at, at the time. And secondly, what, and then finally, sorry, what we, we Objective was the notion of speculative ethics and Frankenstein futures. Yes, you can imagine all these possibilities, but whether that would actually ever come, come into being is not something that we thought it's appropriate to try and comment on, on now. And so we, we uh, addressed the, the issues that way, but we also, I, I hope, in doing that, we confirmed not just the agency of the participants, but also the nature of this as um, a future facing project. My final couple of slides 
um, bring me to my own academic reflections on all of this. Because after I stepped down from uh, being the chair, I asked myself, well, what kind of arrangement is that that UK Biobank has actually put in place? I keep saying any time I talk about this that it's, a, it's an experiment in governance. It didn't require any new law. Um, at the time, broad consent was controversial. The council itself, it was, I think, it still is, is a fairly unique entity and it's only focusing on the UK Biobank. But what is it as, a, as, a, a, as an experiment in governance? And I argue elsewhere that I think it's a form of what I call reflexive governance. And my definition of reflexive governance there is at the top. I think reflexive governance is a system of in parallel development and partnership in governance, which is typified by arrangements which facilitate mutual learning over time. So it's not this top down command and control regulatory mechanism where you've got the regulator and the regulated, and we will tell you what to do, we will tell you what you're not doing it. It's much more this horizontal relationship with critical friend where actually, as I hope those examples show, because new issues do arise in the required dialogue, it's a partnership in, in, in exchange of views of what is an appropriate, defensible, and justifiable way, way to proceed. The way in which I typify what I mean by reflective governance in terms of its elements is to suggest that you need guiding principles, you need to have a mechanism whereby you can reflect on what's an appropriate approach. You need to be clear what the integrity of purpose is, something the UK Biobank is, has its ethics and governance framework. And you also need proportionality of action. So going back to the, the, the example about whether or not you need to re reconsent people about the IT situation, how do you have to disproportionate reaction given what was actually proposed? I think also it's important to have stakeholder involvement. So the, the council at that time had been engaging with publics and, and, and others. And the critical friend model is not regulation, it's, it's a specific aspect of governance. And you can engage not just with participants, but other, with, with other audiences as well. And I think fundamentally, in order for it to be legitimate, you've got to have complementarity. You've got to show that this is actually adding value to everything else that's already out there. Because the regulatory frameworks, the legal frameworks, are already sufficiently burdensome. If it's not adding value, it's really not defensible and helpful. So just to pull that all together in my final slide, I think, therefore, that UK Biobank is an example of reflexive governance. The ethics and governance framework demonstrates the integrity of purpose. That's the benchmark against which the conduct of UK Biobank will be measured. That's a public-facing document that has to evolve with the project. The Ethics and Governance Council, I think, acts as this independent critical friend in this horizontal relationship. You have, and have had, all the way along with UK Biobank, in parallel development of the scientific protocol and also the governance. There's that mutual learning. As the project's developed, so has, has the governance. And the most recent example of that is imaging, and we don't have time to get into that. But the governance system has had to adapt as the, as the project also develops. And also you've got this uh, opportunity for in parallel engagement with shifting landscapes, which I think allows this reflexivity. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a little bit disappointed that there's not more engagement with participants and publics. Um, the council's not doing that, but it, there was a review of the council in 2010-11, and it was suggested that that, that shouldn't uh, take place, but I think that, that would actually strengthen a lot of uh, what's actually going on here. My final point is whether or not a model like UK Biobank might actually be of assistance to the sorts of projects that Mike mentioned right at the beginning, or indeed other projects inter internationally. As far as I'm aware, it remains quite a unique experiment in governance, but I think there's a lot of value in it, and I would enjoy discussing that further with you. Thank you.